The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. Uh, we're going to do our SolidCam live session today. Uh, this is a 30-minute training, free training session for everybody in attendance. Uh, my name is Mark. I'll be doing the, the training session today. And with me, as always, is Kevin Reichel. Hey, Kevin. How are you? Hey, guys. Okay. Um, so if there are any questions right off the bat, let's take a look. Uh, uh, so Frank, if you could hear me, uh, there you could dial in. Uh, actually, it's probably a dumb comment to say if you can hear me. But if you can hear me, then that's all you need because there is no actual. Um, um, uh, you'll be hearing us, me and Kevin, talk. This is a webinar for everybody, so we won't really be taking uh, vocal questions. You'll have to type in your question like you've done there. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you if anyone if you don't have me on your computer speakers, then in addition to signing up, you should have got an email that gives you phone information, a phone number you can dial in, and a meeting ID and an audio pin that lets you uh, uh, attend the audio portion. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, if there's any questions, let's get to them right away. I mean, the the purpose of the SolidCam Live is to give you some training uh, on any questions you have right now. But there is a question we got at the end of the last session which is kind of relating to what we were talking about, uh, and that is 3D eye machining. So uh, the question was, in 3D eye machining, um, when you're using multi-tool, uh, do you need to change the parameters or can you change the parameters uh, for each tool? And the answer is yes. Um, if I open up this 3D eye machining that's been applied to this part, even though it has two tool paths in the list, it's actually from this one window. So multi-tool allows you to do uh, the multiple tools, but each tool actually is uh, is, ref is um, represented here. So the window is not changing, but when you click on the tool, you get the different parameters. So a good example of that would be if we go to the technology wizard section. Uh, I have this at machining level eight turbo for tool four, and that gives me those season speeds there. If you pay attention to that, while I switch it to tool one, it gives us the different season speeds. Now in this case, these are both machining level eight turbo uh, but let's say we take this guy off turbo for now if I go to tool 4 tool 4 was still on turbo so you can see you get independent controls over each tool so it's like it appears in your toolpath list they exist as two different toolpaths but the way we control those toolpaths is in this one window and that's the purpose of the multi-tool the multi-tool is allowing us to basically choose one set of geometry uh, different tools, different levels. So basically, everything that's shared is in this section here. You're going to use the same technology, uh, or sorry, the the, the same uh, geometry. Uh, you might get individual working areas, I believe. Let's see if I can just add a working area real quick here. So I'll just use my select face just to grab this face right here. Okay, so I'll click OK on that. If I switch to tool four, for it does not have that. So you get the same functionality you would get with two separate toolpaths just in this one window, basically. Uh, and is there a difference in parameters? Should you just... Um, well, you, what you can do is if you, if you do it this way with the multi-tool, you get the two separate toolpaths or you get as many toolpaths as you have in this list here, uh, and you get individual control of them. But if for whatever reason, let's say you wanted to, instead of doing just the target, you want to do a part with some cap surfaces. And if you know what I mean by cap surfaces, and if you don't know what I mean by cap surfaces, there's a tips and tricks video on our YouTube channel where I cover what to do in the case of, uh, let's say on a 3D model like this, if there's a hole in it, how to add a cap surface. And then to use that in a 3D toolpath, instead of just using target, you would actually click new, select your target solid in addition to those cap surfaces and that lets you uh, avoid having the tool going down into any kind of holes or anything like that in your surface um, but that is one reason why you might want to separate this as not a multi-tool toolpath but a separate toolpath completely that would also be known as a uh, filled surface it's because you wanted a filled uh, surface yeah You're, you use the filled surface option from solidworks but i um yep. yeah no that's terminology, <laughs> but I, I call it a cap surface because I'm really just kind of capping off a hole. Um, but uh, the next part of that question was, because we did cover uh, a little bit of HSR yesterday, is uh, HSR versus eye machining, or I guess in this case, 3D eye machining, uh, one versus the other. So um, at least in my opinion, 3D eye machining 
for one, is eye machining. So you're getting the benefit of that, uh, that trichoidal toolpath being applied to an overall 3D part. Uh, fees and speeds are generated for you, getting the optimization of the cycle time. Um, and uh, I guess between the two, they, they have a similar stock recognition functionality if you turn it on in the HSR, but in 3D eye machining, it automatically does that. Uh, a good example is right here. I have two sets of toolpaths here. They're both roughing out the part. And this is my demo part, so it's actually intended to show one versus the other. Uh, I would have to suppress these to really show this off. But the idea here is with 3D eye machining, I have one tool path. I'm using multi-tool. I'm using multiple tools to do the, uh, to do the main roughing and then the rest roughing. Um, with HSR, it has that same ability, uh, but we don't have multi-tool, so I have to break it down to separate tool paths. But also the rest roughing, um, I, I actually have to engage that. I have to tell it to be a rest roughing operation. Whereas every second, third, every subsequent eye machining toolpath is automatically a rest roughing toolpath. Yeah, so which could be a benefit. In, in oh, yeah. another sense, you know, the for between Mark and I's experience with using HSR and 3D eye machining, pretty much on a daily basis, 3D eye machining is going to be your go-to. Um, it's, it's like hitting the easy button for programming. It really takes out the, the the a lot of the factors. It takes out a lot of the thinking that you guys have to do on feeds and speeds, chip load, all that stuff. So um, we understand that you know with 3D I machine, it may not be 100% what you're looking for, and that's why we have the HSR in there. So um, in both. Mark, or I would assume Mark and I would be on the same page where I machining, 3D I machining is definitely going to be your go to as much as possible um, just uh, for that. Total agreement. Yeah, 3D I machining is one of our more powerful, if not the powerfulest uh, toolpath we have. Um, and uh, one thing also that is kind of a difference between the two is by default, any eye machining toolpath, but 3D eye machining, I get this question a lot, is the use of ball mills. Uh, you'll notice in the settings here, this is a part level setting, but in the global setting, it also has this, that for eye machining, you actually have to tell it to allow the use of ball mills. So eye machining was developed for flat end mills. You can use a ball end mill, but like we say there, it's not technically supported. It's actually something that is uh, not part of the development, but you can use a ball mill, whereas HSR, it is developed for use with whatever shape of tool you're going to use for your roughing. So you can use a ball mill, bull end mill, flat end mill, uh, whatever would make sense for your part. And that's why HSR does have, you can use HSR a little more for really curve heavy parts. Uh, not to say that 3D eye machining won't do that as well, but there are some techniques and techniques technologies inside HSR that are more geared towards very curve heavy, maybe medical kind of uh, parts, mold parts, or something like that. Okay, so I see there's a question there. Uh, can you change any parameter in multi-tool just by selecting the tool in that small window and then changing the parameters from there? Yes. yes. So that's the point of that small window on the side. Let me open this guy back up. So I'm looking to change something about tool four. I'll click on tool four, and now everything in this window is geared towards tool four. If I go in there, I can change the levels. So let's say I only intend to go down by 50, well, let's say half inch. So with tool four being a smaller tool, because it is the next in the list, so it should be a smaller diameter tool for the step down, I'm not really intending for it to go all the way down. Maybe it doesn't have the reach to go all the way down. I just want to go and do what's possible with this tool, maybe just the first half inch. I've changed that level here. If I click in the small window for tool one, uh, actually, well, for whatever reason, let's just put that to minus one, and then we'll go back to tool four. Okay, like, that should not be working like that. <laughs> in in certain parameters, it is going to work that way. Is what we're getting at here. Yeah, in certain 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 sections, it's I guess I don't know. I'd probably have to restart the file or something. But you should have the ability to independently control it. And if not, like we're doing here, um, I probably would just do a separate toolpath completely just to control it separately anyway. But um, there are separate uh, parameters like we saw with the technology wizard. So if I set this to level four and then go to tool one, or actually tool four, again, it, it changes it. So you have independent control over your tool selections using this small window over here. And you're not just uh, limited to two tools. You can have as many tools as you want in there um, and that 
you can toggle back and forth between those very quickly by what Mark was just showing you guys. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, the other question is, can you change how much stock you leave? Uh, so let's say on technology section, I have this set to 10 thou. With tool four, again, maybe I don't want to leave so much material. Let's set this to 20 thou for the wall and the floor. And let me just click my mouse somewhere else so we can go back and forth. So we'll click on that one, 10 thou. Click on that one, 20 thou. So you have the ability to get your automatic rest operations to be different parameters. So in this case, I probably want to use this smaller diameter tool to get into some tighter corners on this part, but I'm not really intending to redo the entire part, uh, which would happen if I if I either had the same um, uh, wall offsets or or less or more. Uh, by putting it more here, I'm actually getting it to ignore all the 10 thou I left on these faces and really just focus on the areas that the rest operation really need to work on, maybe somewhere in there. And like Mark was saying, you can you can just keep stepping down so you can start off with a half inch end mill, go down to a three eighths, go down to a quarter, and then go down to uh, an eighth inch end mill. And that just keep bouncing down, and it's constantly looking at that updated stock for you guys and letting it's only going to cut where there's leftover material. Exactly. Uh, okay, so next question. Uh, can eye machining be used for a finished pass by making offsets zero? Um, in 3D eye machining, currently, there is no finishing option. You can set those values to zero, but remember, this is still eye machining. It's still going to leave some scallops. So I could probably put these values to zero, but you're still going to see whatever scallop height is left behind. Uh, I mean, if you put this all at zero, um, I don't know. I've never done all yeah, of these at zero. Yeah, I actually have. Um, so I was on site over in at uh, Toyota, and they didn't have a very high tolerance um, set up for their 3D molds, and they were cutting out of wax. And so what we were able to do is put their wall offset at zero, and we put their scallop at 5 thou, even though that it is just a roughing strategy, we actually achieved a very um, incredible uh, finish on there for that, that wax mold. And, you know, it wasn't um, anything finished, but I would have looked at it and said that was a finished part after it was done. The scallops were very nicely done, um, but it's not, it's not something, if you're looking to achieve that ultimate finish, then you're definitely going to want to come back and use either HSM or HSS to address those. Area. And that basically leads us into the next question. So uh, HSS operation will be for finishing. Yes, HSS and HSM are our finishing toolpaths. Now, when you choose one versus the other, uh, actually is addressed by another video on the YouTube channel. But uh, basically, the, the main focus, uh, the main difference is HSS is a surface-based toolpath. So if I open up, let's say, one of these HSS toolpaths, uh, this one being the constant Z one, um, you'll see that the geometry is surface-based. I told it I'd like to do that specific surface right there, telling it that exact one is the one I want to finish. Whereas with an HSM toolpath, let's do the... I think I like to one. think of HSM as laying a blanket over this entire part, where HSS is really geared towards to clean up and fine-tune specific areas. Correct, a much more surgical finishing. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the, the point uh, I was gonna make here with the geometry. The solid-based toolpath, HSM, looks at the entire solid, and it'll lay, like Kevin said, lay a blanket of a toolpath. So if we take a look at this toolpath, it laid down that toolpath on the entire part. My geometry is the target itself. Uh, to get a similar looking toolpath in HSS, I'd have to select all those individual surfaces just to lay down that same blanket. To get a surgical toolpath like we get with HSS, in HSS, I choose the individual surface. In HSM, I have to use constraint boundaries to limit the travel of the tool to within the boundaries of that one surface. So both toolpaths can do almost the exact same thing. It's just there's more work required for one thing versus the other. So with HSM, if you are looking to do the entire part, then use HSM. You can select the solid, select your target, maybe even maybe add a working area or a constraint boundary if you need it, but it's for bulk finishing. Whereas HSS is geared towards individual, like Kevin said, this one 
section, uh, finishing it up sort of thing. So if you have a part like this, you can lay down an entire toolpath kind of like this one right here. This is a linear toolpath for the entire part, but obviously linear is not cleaning up some of these spaces nicely enough. So I could come in there with an HSS and just kind of clean it up a little bit, just that individual surface. Yep. Now we do have one question that came in there, Mark. Um, when using 3DI machining on larger parts, it does take a, quite a bit of time to calculate. Um, so he's looking at computers and computer, it, 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 I, I'm a truck person, so I look at everything as in the aspect of automotive. Right now, if you have a Best Buy computer, you're trying to pull a house along with the Geo Metro car. Um, so the more horsepower that you have of a computer, the faster the calculations are gonna go for you guys. Um, I, and I did put a link um, in the chat for everyone. And maybe Mark, if you just wanna click that and open it up. Um, what that is, is a our recommendations for a system computer. So what this will do is, um, now, Jake, I know some of the components that you guys work on and stuff, so I would stay towards that high end or extreme. But this is, you know, if you go from a basic uh, on the left hand side to an extreme, the basic may take uh, on a particular part 10 minutes, where the extreme would be a couple seconds. So there is quite a bit of difference there. Um, now, it does depend on, you know, the, the higher end you go, the more expensive some of these are going to get for you but your calculation times are gonna be much faster. SolidCam does utilize multi-cores, um, so definitely stay with, you know, something that has many cores, but don't go with the Xeon. Um, stay with like a uh, the i9 or a processor, and it really dependent on your uh, gigahertz, how many gigahertz that you're running for that. So that is your horsepower. <clears throat> Now, talking about calculation time, that, that is a perfect uh, thing to look at, the hardware you're using, but also look at the procedure you're using as well. If you're trying to lay down one toolpath for the entire part, and it's a large, complex part, then it doesn't really matter what you're working with. You're going to have a huge chunk of information to calculate. So what you could do is you could look at it in terms of sections. And this is another thing that I, I think we covered one, uh, in, our, in a previous video, where um, this toolpath here, let's say I'm trying to use linear and it's taking forever to calculate. I probably don't want linear to be applied to the entire part. Or in the case of a second eye machining, a second 3D eye machining toolpath, I'm probably not looking for that one small tool to machine this entire thing. I probably just need to clean up individual areas. That's when you can look at things like levels and working areas or constraint boundaries. If I'm doing some sort of rest operation and it's really chugging along trying to figure out how to calculate the tight areas i might want to just limit the travel of the tool to only the area that i'm looking for that way i don't have to do a massive calculation just to get these individual areas it is kind of an easy idea just to say okay i'm just going to do a save and copy set it to rest operation or save and copy and automatically do a rest operation and then get it to find all the nooks and crannies for me but if you're waiting hours that's not useful to you so you could actually be you know looking at your part a little more detailed and say I probably just need it to be focused on this area here and here maybe something over here so you can set up working areas so instead of actually working on this entire part let me see if I have a better example of that so this entire part with that one toolpath I'm probably just looking to finish that one little area so I can set up a working area that is this circle and then just get that toolpath to work only in that one area or it's like we talked about earlier you're using HSM, and then you're trying to get HSM to do everything, whereas it might just be one little area that you want to focus on, switch to HSS. And traditionally, HSS will calculate faster because um, it's going off of the surface NURB, and where HSM is all based off of the facets, and Mark was talking about those facets yesterday. It's the uh, little triangles that are that make up the part where HSS is actually looking at the model surface NURB itself. So you'll get much better performance that way. Um, now, when you get into those larger parts using like 3D I machine, um, remember, start big, uh, start with a bigger a tool. Don't start out, you know, if you got this big part and you're just wanna go to town with an eighth inch end mill, it's gonna take a while to 
compute all those lines because you think about all the lines of either line segments and arcs that are going through there and we kind of went through this last night in the night class of kind of ways to shorten up those programs but um, definitely uh, tool size will matter for you so don't try to do you know one tool fits all scenario Absolutely. I mean, that, that is the purpose of the multi-tool, to be able to just do that. Say, I'd like to start from a larger tool and work my way down. Uh, so it's exactly like Kevin said. Just use your largest tool, get it to figure out all the big chunks for you, and then switch to your smaller tool, and then focus on where you actually want to use that smaller tool, where the tighter corners are, the tighter, tighter rads. Get, that, get, that, get the software automatic nature to work for you in that regard. Um, okay. Other question. Uh, so, uh, can large size bar parts, two foot by three foot, be, uh, be why the parts are calculating so long? It could be. Uh, it's remember that this is still. Uh, I mean, every time we look at a part, we never know how big the part actually is on in, on screen. But if you are looking at in terms of relative size, let's say we just pull up this part here. I have a tool that is an eighth of an inch. If you just look at the the actual just size of your tool versus your part then that is, like Kevin said, there's lots of arcs there. There's still some calculation to be done to get this thing to move across that part. So it, uh, literally the size of your parts could also be why it takes a long time to calculate. And that's why I was talking about constraint boundaries or working areas, because oftentimes you're not looking to do the entire part with one strategy. We have multiple toolpaths, multiple ways to focus the toolpath. Use that. Take advantage of that and figure out a way to, to use constraint boundaries or just surfaces or whatnot and focus on just those tighter areas. And you'll get quicker toolpaths that when you G-code, it's a long file, but it's made up of little toolpaths using the same tool. And then in, in essence, you're almost doing the same toolpath. Um, okay. And Jake, uh, are, are you running a laptop or what, what, what kind of hardware are you using? Yep, laptop. So, you know, on something like that, like, um, and I can, you know, if you, you should see that link in the chat message, definitely um, have your IT person send that over to them and just tell them about your computer performance. Um, laptops are great for parts that fit in one vice, I like to say. Um, anything that goes beyond, like what uh, Mark is showing right now, we may need to get a little bit more powerful of a system. So, um, I mean, Mark's computer is no speed machine at all. It's just a simple laptop. Uh, Dell, I think it's a, what is it, it's a 6800? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so it's no, I mean, it's a couple of years old, so it's no performance uh, machine at all. But when you get into anything that's larger than your vice with, I mean, if you guys have a bar stock in there and it's just some simple holes, then there's no computing power going on there. But if this part extended out to two foot by three foot, then that's where your computer power is really going to come into factor. So. Okay, and to answer that last question, uh, do you cr create the constraint boundaries in SolidWorks? Yes, pretty much anything that is CAD or design is going to be a SolidWorks functionality, and you'll see here that that toolpath that had that work constraint boundary, that's just a sketch that I created inside SolidWorks. And um, sorry, I kept interjecting here, but anything that Mark draws on this part file right here, it stays only to this SolidCam file. So um, any changes that Mark makes to this file does not reflect back to the original model. And that's one, to comply with the ISO 9000 standard, but two, that the um, programmer isn't making any changes to the model. Um, so you guys can come in here and draw sketch lines, uh, geometry lines, anything that you want. And like I said, it will not reflect back to the original model for you. But if we go the reverse flow, it's a one-way valve. So if the engineer makes a change to this model, SolidCam is going to automatically recognize that change for you, and it's going to prompt you saying, um, the model has been changed. Would you like to change it? You can say yes, no, or ask me later. I like to do the ask me later because at that point, I go to the engineer and say, hey, would you guys change on here before I open up this file and see something completely different? So. 
Yep. And what Kevin's referring to is uh, design model versus everything outside the design model. So since we're working with SolidCam external, we're actually working inside of a type of assembly. And in that assembly, we have design model, which is the SolidCam copy of the original model. So this is everything that's associative. Everything you brought in on the front end becomes associative. So like Kevin said, if, if you open up your SolidCam file, it's actually going to look back at the original SolidWorks file and check for those changes. But like Kevin said, everything outside of that, the cam solid and all these vices that I've added here in my sketches, those only exist inside of my solid cam file. So the original design model does not see that. Not only does it maintain ISO standards, but um, you don't add anything that would disrupt the design side of things, just like you don't want them to do anything that would disrupt your programming side of things. So all these sketches would get in the way of somebody trying to design their part, or these tool paths would get in the way of somebody designing their part. Well, they don't see that. We, uh, once you're opening up just the SolidCam file, that's only for us to see. Yep. Okay, uh, so we have about four minutes left. <clears throat> and Jake, I see your last question there. If you want, um, definitely send that over to me in an email. If you guys can, I know a lot of stuff is locked on for you guys, but uh, if that's possible, send it over to me and I can take a look at it for you. Um, okay. Do you got anything else for the last uh, few minutes here? Uh, to, uh, well, completely start on a new topic and then. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, like I mentioned yesterday, we actually are going to have one of these every day until May 1st, uh, every day at 2 p.m. Eastern time. This is a kind of a, 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 a teaser at the kind of training we do one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So if you're interested in getting one-on-one -on -one training, uh, just give your your uh, your salesperson for your area a call and get them to give you a quote on how we would do online training using GoToMeeting. Uh, it would actually be, uh, like I said, one-on-one. -on -one. So you'd actually be able to live talk to me or whoever else on the training team that you, you end up talking to, and it would be live questions. We can work on your parts. For so for for instance, like Jake, if uh, if they if your company ended up using your one-on-one -on -one training, you can get into a training session with Kevin or with me, and we can actually specifically work with you on your part, addressing your questions live. Um, uh, we'll be doing this every day. So if you would like, you could send me an email with any topics or questions you have. Let me just put that in there. And we'll, co we'll, we'll cover it in a follow-up session, uh, maybe the day after we get it. Or if you send this to me in the morning, then we can address it on the day of. So and that should be my email there. One thing I really want to stress, and I, I kind of stress this for the guys that were in the uh, night class last night, is everybody, um, I would assume that you guys are viewing this because you guys got that uh, Corona uh, email mailing that we sent out. Let us know what we can do to help you guys out. Um, we're all in this together. And one thing I really want to push out to you guys is we know that a lot of you guys are working from home right now. If you guys need those temporary licenses to work from home or work from different locations, let myself know. Um, let your account manager know and we will get those sent over to you ASAP. Um, just if you do, if you do want that license, um, just one thing I want you to remember is all the parts that you program, um, this license is going to give you everything. So you're not going to just have, you know, two and a half D, you will have every operation there is. So when you get back to work and you're using your actual license that you were using before, some of that stuff might not be there. So. Definitely just let us know how we can help you guys out. Absolutely. It's like Kevin said, we're, we're all in this together sort of thing. So if you are needing any kind of uh, help at all, any way we can help, give us a call. Uh, there, there's only way, one way through this, and that's together. Um, so uh, we'll, I guess we'll leave it at that. So hopefully everybody stay safe. Um, if you're essential, thank you for your work. Uh, it's work still needs to be done so everybody going to work even if you're not working from home you're still going into the shop thank you and uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow at 2 p.m eastern time all right thanks everyone